All right. Well, happy Mother's Day to all you mothers out there. I, uh, I was lightly rebuked for, for missing it this morning. Lightly. It wasn't a heavy rebuke, but I, I, I eventually got around to, to saying it. So to our mom, my mom, my wife. <laughs> Okay, why don't we uh, go before the Lord and just ask Him to bless our time this morning. Heavenly Father, we just pause right now to prepare our hearts. We want this to be an act of worship. We want this to be the, um, just the motive of our heart to come before you, sincere and genuine um, worship, adoration, affection toward you. We pray that as we continue to t study this topic of, of marriage and even looking at uh, the unmarried in more detail today, we just pray that it would be a rich blessing to those who are in this state and for us who are married, it's just resources to where we can counsel others who are seeking marriage or thinking about remaining unmarried, a life of celibacy. So we just pray that this would be a rich study and that it would be helpful and just pray that your glory would be put on display and that Christ would be exalted. We love you. We thank you for this time in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> well, as we, uh, as we start our time this morning, I would like you to just pause for a moment. Think about some of the ways in which you are distracted, have been distracted from your devotion to Jesus Christ. Maybe now, maybe at some point in the past, recently. This is what I'm attempting to set before you this morning. If you're a Christian and you've made it your aim in life to, to follow Jesus Christ in every possible way that He expects from you, then I'd like you to briefly consider how you get sidetracked from that one objective. From following Christ, how, how do you get sidetracked, distracted? What divides your attention and your affection to Him? I mean, it's pretty obvious that we live in a world of distractions. Constantly bombarded with interruptions, disturbances. I mean, if you stop and think about all the numerous ways in which this world offers up one, it offers up one distraction after another. Disrupts us from our intended goal of imitating Christ with our life and becoming conformed into His likeness and image. I mean, if you think about a list, it would seemingly go on for a very long time. You don't have to search very hard or very long to expose what distractions exist in this world. Think about it. Just for example, here's a few. Entertainment. Entertainment is a massive distraction. The TV shows maybe that you enjoy, the movies that you rent, uh, your computer, your phone, the, the apps that you download on your phone, all other electronic devices, the, the, their social media distractions, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, surfing on the World Wide Web, enormous distractions. But if it's not entertainment for you, then maybe another distraction would be your responsibilities or occupational goals, your work. If you're a workaholic, you may be consumed with Business meetings, quotas, agendas, deadlines, career accomplishments and achievements, personal success. Maybe you're just trying to, to work harder so that you could obtain some type of job security. That could be a distraction to your devotion to Jesus Christ. Money is a very common distraction in this life. One could easily be consumed and overly concerned about the stock market, mortgage on your home, your portfolio, a retirement plan, a certain economic status, a desired income, your investments, how much money's in your checking or in your savings account, how much debt you have. Those financial categories could easily distract you from undivided devotion to Christ. The list is almost endless. Any form of leisure could distract you. Hobbies could be a distraction. Friends could be a distraction. Hardships and trials could even be a distraction. You name it, basically anything could turn your undivided devotion away from the Lord and onto lesser and secondary things. Now, I'm not going to immediately say that any of the, of the things that I mentioned are inherently sinful or bad. None of those things are by nature evil or, or, or corrupt or immoral, 
But they all have the tendency to become misdirected and misplaced objects in a Christian's walk with Christ if they're not closely monitored and kept in their proper perspective. It's just the reality. That goes for anything in life. Well, interesting enough, even the most intimate, the most sacred, the most unique human relationship that God has divinely blessed can become one of the greatest distractions to someone's devotion to the Lord. The marriage relationship. And it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 where the Apostle Paul is going to spend some time talking once again to the single crowd about this possible distraction. I mean, we've, we've been studying this very, in, very interesting topic on marriage in this letter to the Corinthians, and Paul has addressed a number of different marital issues in chapter 7. What are some of those issues? Well, just briefly, just in review, Paul has talked about how husbands and wives should be intentional about intimately interacting with one another, all the way back in verses 2 uh, through 5. And then he's also mentioned how Christian men and women are gifted by God for either a life of celibacy or a life of marriage in verses 6 through 9 of this chapter. He's highlighted how marriage is a permanent union and it should never be carelessly tossed to the side or flippantly broken. Christian wife or husband should always strive to protect and preserve the marital bond as much as it depends on them. We saw that in verses 10 through 16. Then in verses 17 through 24, he illustrates how a man and a woman's marital status should remain the same after they become a Christian. And then once you get to verse 25, and all the way to the end of the chapter, Paul now specifically wants to have a heart-to-heart -heart with the unmarried group in the church. He's got some valid advice for how the single crowd should think through this whole marriage thing. Paul will actually, at this point in time, he will actually be a proponent for celibacy. A life of unmarried bliss. A life in the state of singleness. And he has some legitimate reasons for this kind of counsel. Paul believes that in light of the present dis distress that he mentions in verse 26 and verse 28, these external pressures, these hardships, these, these difficulties that are surrounding the Christian church, the single saint should consider remaining single. There's no reason to bring your heart into an emotional, tightly knit relationship when there's current circumstances that could threaten that relationship and only increase your hardships and maybe increase your burdens. But that wasn't the only reason why he, he was a proponent for sing, remaining single. Verses 29 through 31 he wanted to make sure that everyone was fully aware of how shortened the time has become. Christ could return at any given moment. The, the cross has begun something that wasn't begun before. We know that time is shortened. The kingdom work will not go on forever. The single Christian has the opportunity to take full advantage of their single status. And when we know that time is of the essence, what better way to spend your life than to be married to the purposes of God rather than married to an earthly other. And as I mentioned before in the previous weeks, it's just an option. It's not a mandate. Paul's not mandating this for every Christian. It's just an option. And for the single crowd here, it's an option that should be considered, thought through. <coughs> but now Paul gets a little bit more forthright. He's going to ramp up his counsel a little bit. He doesn't want the single crowd to just blindly rush into marriage without hearing yet another perspective about what marriage does to the Christian life. Paul explains further why he thinks that remaining single is better. He wants them to be free of pressures, free of marital concerns, free of these relational anxieties that naturally come with having a spouse. And again, I know I've mentioned this in the past few weeks, but I hope that every single Christian, every unmarried person in our midst, young and old, would take this counsel to heart. If you can live according to this type of counsel, do so. Do so. And we'll understand why here in a little bit. So right now, if you would, I'd like you to follow along as I read 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 32 through 35. That's where we're going to spend our time this morning. 
Let's get a little dose of apostolic advice and think about what Paul is setting before us here, primarily addressing those who are single in the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 32. Paul says this, But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. Paul's major premises in this section, as he continues in his counsel to the unmarried group in the church, is that they would be free from concern. It's the very first thing that he mentions in verse 32. I want you, the single saints, referring to the single saints in the church, I want you to be free from concern. Paul doesn't want Christians, specifically the, the single Christians, to be bogged down, overly burdened with the cares of this world. The phrase free from concern is actually one word in the Greek. It literally means without worries. It's plural. Without anxieties or free from cares. Paul's desire is that the Christian would be more and more free from the cares of this world. Or we could understand Paul to be saying that he wants them to be free from the concerns that are only applied to the world or free from the anxieties that could be provoked by the world. I think all of those fit that word. In one sense, Paul is actually exhorting these bachelors, these believing bachelors and believing bachelorettes to have a carefree Christian life. That could be the meaning of the word. Be free from the cares that involve this world, a carefree Christian life. Now, I want to be careful here because I don't want anyone to think that Paul is just saying, be free from all the concerns while in this world. There's a difference of, of the world, concerns of the world, and the concerns while in, having concerns while in this world. Paul's not saying that we should have absolutely no cares during our earthly existence. This carefree life, the, the concerns that Paul would like all singles to be freed from, is not the same kind of carefree life that much of our culture promotes. It's not the same thing. Paul hope, Paul's hope is not that these single Christians would have an easygoing life or a relaxed life or a relaxed approach to life or a minimal effort toward anything. Paul's not promoting the carefree lifestyle that is comprised of more comfort, ease, security, a life that's absent of any responsibilities or pressures or demands. That's not what he's pushing for here. Paul wants the single crowd to be carefree from more and more momentary things, marriage being one of them, marriage being the specific topic in this context, so that they can have undivided cares for more eternal things. That's what Paul's point is here. Paul's expressing his concern that the unmarried crowd at Corinth would make it their aim to not have any distractions that divide their lives into parts and fragments them in their devo devotion to Jesus Christ. It's to be liberated from the things that would distract the Christian in order to be devoted to one specific object, namely Jesus Christ and His gospel, His mission. And as a general principle, this would apply to everyone in the church. This doesn't just apply to the single crowd. Every believer should strive for greater undivided attention and affection to Jesus Christ. But since Paul's addressing the single crowd, giving advice to them, counseling them, they need to listen. Those who have a single status in the church need to consider remaining single for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Christ. Paul's counseling the single Christian to be free from concern. What does that look like? Well, there are two components to Paul's counsel here. 
Two components to Paul's counsel toward the unmarried group in the church. The first component of Paul's counsel toward the unmarried group in the church involves him just really just painting a vivid picture of what his counsel is. Paul is going to paint a vivid picture of his counsel toward the unmarried group in the church, verses 32 through 34. And then there's a second component to Paul's counsel toward the unmarried in the church, and it involves just providing a very clear purpose for his counsel. Paul will support his counsel of what he says in verses 32 through 34 with legitimate reasons, again, clear-cut reasons in verse 35. So we're going to look at the picture Paul paints in verses 32 through 34, and then the purpose or the reason that Paul provides in verse 35. First component, the picture Paul paints for the unmarried group. Look at verse 32 again. Paul says, But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But, by way of contrast, one who is married is concerned about the things of this world, how he may please his wife. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. The very first thing that I want to highlight, point out in these verses is that Paul is giving equal counsel and insight to both men and women about the distractions that come with marriage. He's giving equal insight and advice. This is not one-sided counsel for men only, as some might perceive it to be. Some people like to read these verses and discriminate by saying that a wife will only bring distractions to the husband. Very one-sided. But they fail to view it the other way, that a husband will also bring some distractions to a wife. We have to understand this counsel as equal to both genders. And just to give you an explanation of how I come to that conclusion, in verse 32 it says, one who is unmarried. And then at the beginning of verse 33 it says, but one who is married. The group of people that Paul has in mind there, when he uses the word one, one who is married and one who is unmarried, is, it's actually the men in the church. He's using the masculine there. It's the masculine form being used in verses 32 and 33. Paul's addressing the males in, that, in those verses. They need to realize that by, be, by marrying a wife, there will be certain distractions added to their life. But then, once you get to verse 34, he gives the exact same counsel to the women in the church. Not one-sided. Verse 34, the woman who is unmarried, the virgin, and then later in verse 34 it says, one who is married. Paul is using the feminine form now. So Paul's addressing the women in the church, and they also need to know that by having a husband, there will be certain limitations and constraints added to their life. Now, Again, maybe this is overkill, but the only reason why I'm bringing this to your attention, that Paul's addressing both men and women in the church, is to show that this doesn't, uh, Paul just doesn't gather up the men in, of the church and have a men's meeting and say, hey, if you want to be totally freed up to maximize your efforts to the Lord, then don't marry a woman. And then he doesn't ever give that counsel to the women. Paul doesn't show any forms of prejudice here by calling only the men of the church together to tell them that a wife is nothing more than a ball and chain, going to slow you down, it's going to hinder your spiritual progress. No, Paul's counsel is not discriminating or one-sided. In a sense, he's saying to both groups, men and women, uh, both could possibly be ball and chains. Both could slow you down. Both could distract you from your devotion to the Lord if you're not careful. So Paul first addresses the men, and he says in verse 32, the unmarried man is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. When a single Christian man looks at his Christian life and how he can utilize it for the glory of God and the advancement of God's kingdom, he doesn't ever have to give consideration to an earthly other, to a spouse, to a wife. There's an undistracted devotion that comes in the life of an unmarried man. His, his concerns, his anxieties, his cares, all of those terms in this verse being positive, 
All of his cares can be set on one single object, the Lord Jesus Christ, his purposes, his mission. The single man has the opportunity to set all their attention and devotion and cares on their relationship to the Lord and how they can serve him. The idea behind the word please, how a man could please the Lord, it includes the thought of service in the interest of others. And in this case, it's referring to God. Service to God. This is the extent of Paul's preference for celibacy. He wants people to be given to the service of God without distraction. The unmarried man has that freedom. I remember when I was single, and it wasn't that long ago, it was just a little bit over four years ago, but I remember as a single man, I, I had massive opportunities to serve Christ in a very various different ways, different ways. And I never had to consider the cares or the concerns of a wife. I was single for the first two years of, of my seminary career. I could give myself to undivided study, devotion. I could study as long as I want, when I wanted, how I wanted. Prior to that, I had the freedom to go to China. Didn't have to consider a wife or any kids, how they would be affected by a culture, conditions. Prior to China, I had the freedom to involve myself in all sorts of church activities without having to worry of, uh, about getting home at a certain time or thinking about how much time I was missing with my family. None of that was there. I had the freedom to sit around and talk with other single Christian friends about doctrine and theology. I mean, there was a time in my Christian life and in Pastor Matt's Christian life when he would go on these jogs, and he lived right down the street from me, and he would stop by the house, and we would just talk for hours about theology and doctrine. No cares. No concerns about a wife being affected. What's she thinking? Is, am I spending too much time with him? Am I not? None of that. I could focus as much of my energy on him as I wanted. That's how the unmarried Christians in the church should be thinking at this point in time. The unmarried man is concerned about the things of the Lord. He may, how he may please the Lord. Now, I do want us to understand that this is potential only. This is potential only. Not every unmarried Christian will use their singleness to serve the Lord. This is potential only. So just because you're single and just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you're automatically thrown into the category of those who are pleasing the Lord. It's not about status. It's what you do with your status that matters. It doesn't matter if you're single. If you're not devoted to the Lord... It's vain. It's empty. It's meaningless. If you're single, what are you doing with your singleness? I mean, that, that's an implied question from what Paul's talking about here. If you're single, what are you doing with your singleness? Are you greatly concerned about the things of the Lord? Are you burdened about what God is burdened about? And are you using your single status to maximize and magnify what God is focused on, primarily the gospel of Jesus Christ and making his name known? Or are you concerned with the things of the world and you're just another single Christian who's not taken up a great amount of interest in what God is interested in? Both, both could be true of you. If you're a single Christian, you, you have the greatest amount of time to maximize your efforts for the Lord. Now, on the flip side, the married man does not have that same potential. Not necessarily the same opportunities, equal opportunity. Verse 33, but, and this is Paul contrasting what he just said, but one, and he's talking about the man, who is married is concerned about the things of the, lo of, of the world, how he may please his wife. The married man, by contrast, must have a certain uh, amount of affairs, or a certain concern about the affairs of this world. Now, when Paul mentions the, the things of the world, he does not mean worldliness in the sense that a married man is concerned about the, the sinful things of the world. If that, if that were the case, Paul would be implying that marriage is sinful. To take a wife is sinful. And later on in this chapter, he says it's absolutely not sinful to be married. So he's not talking about the world in that sense. There are multiple ways in the New Testament for how the word world can be used in Scripture. It's not talking about sinfulness, corruptness, a fallen world system. When Paul says that the married man is concerned about the things of the world, he explains what he means immediately following. 
how a man may please his wife. There's nothing negative about that. Nothing sinful about that. All he's saying is that the married man must consider the interest of his family, of his wife. These are the things that are for this world only. He has earthly obligations, sometimes distracted from those eternal obligations, duties, desires. The married man can't just do the things of the Lord when he wants to, or how he wants to, or where he wants to at any given moment. At least, I don't know of any marriages that operate well under those situations where a husband just does what he wants and the, the wife's not involved at all. I, I would imagine that a marriage wouldn't operate well in, 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 with that kind of uh, system taking place, pattern. A wife influences these decisions. When they are done, how they are done, where they are done. The married man must consider not only how to please the Lord, but also how to please the wife. He is naturally divided. And that's why Paul says at the beginning of verse 34, and his interests are divided. Naturally divided. And again, there's, there's no reason to jump to an illogical conclusion and make Paul to saying that marriage is a negative thing. We should think that Paul is saying that pleasing the Lord is a good thing and pleasing a wife is a good thing. Both are good. Not one is not sinful and the other one appropriate. Paul's not saying that. He simply observes that marriage imposes demands and responsibilities that cannot be neglected. Well, Paul then goes on in verse 34 to address the unmarried women in the church. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin. Those terms could be synonymous. It's hard to say the unmarried could refer maybe to the widows in the church. The virgin could refer to the one who's never been married. The one who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Everything that was already mentioned for the men is now equally applied to the single women in the church. The only difference is that Paul uses some different words to show what the unmarried woman can focus her attention toward. Paul says that an unmarried Christian woman can focus on how to be holy both in body and spirit. Instead of saying that she is concerned about how to please the Lord, like he does up in verse 32 for the men, Paul says that she may be holy both in body and spirit. Now, being holy in body does not mean that she is pure because she avoids the sexual relations that marriage imposes. All, all Christians are to be holy in body, whether they're married or not. It's just the, the combination of body and spirit describes the whole person, the, the complete person, and it means that she strives to be holy, set apart, separate in every way, and is totally devoted to the Lord. The whole person. That's all he means. How she can please the Lord. The unmarried Christian woman has no distractions from how she serves the Lord. She too can maximize her efforts in serving Jesus Christ and his church. But when the husband comes, she now has to take into consideration the affairs of the world. How to care for him, accommodate the concerns of him. I mean, my wife doesn't have the freedom, and many of you wives don't have the freedom to just up and leave at any given moment. It's not how marriage works. You know that. Like any faithful wife, my wife, she takes a genuine interest in managing the home well, meeting the needs of our children, functioning under the leadership uh, of her husband, myself. Those are the affairs of this world. She just can't venture off to serve in the church independently of her husband and children. She has to take them into account and meet their worldly needs, our worldly needs. She maintains all her responsibilities in the home. She provides meals for myself and the kids. If she were single, she wouldn't have those concerns. Could potentially spend all her energy serving in the church instead of doing endless loads of laundry. Constant diaper changes. Constant trips to the grocery store. 
continuous cleaning, cooking in the home, whatever it might be. If she were single, she could be set apart her entire body and spirit, her whole person to the Lord's work as a single gal. Paul's giving the church, the single crowd, a reality check here. Something to think through. He's being very practical, very upfront. These are the demands and limitations that come with being married. And I've only mentioned a few. That There are massive ones, multiple ones, endless ones. What's sad is that the single crowd in the church typically doesn't even think about these things and how it will affect their energy and their efforts to the Lord. The only thing the single crowd thinks about is, I want a companion and I want intimacy. That's usually what's the driving force of wanting to be married. Paul says, think through it. There are greater purposes here, eternal purposes here to be thinking about. There's a second component to Paul's counsel. Paul also provides... He's painted this picture of what it looks like, but now he provides a clear purpose for his counsel toward the unmarried in the church. Reasons. These are clear-cut reasons, or a reason. You can say that there's four reasons here. You can just lump them all together and say there's one. But he's driving to an apex, to a climax, at, at the end of verse 35, and we'll get there. Look at verse 35, the clear purpose. He says, This I say which is referring to all the counsel and the advice about remaining single, this I say, for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. Paul starts off verse 35 and he says, the life, a life of celibacy, it has benefits. It, 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 the word literally means uh, advantages. It's advantageous. It, it's profitable. Extremely beneficial. Do you know the line of thought that verse 35 confronts? It's the line of thought that believes that a person who goes unmarried in this life never truly lived life to the fullest. Sometimes our society thinks that way. Oh, if you, never, if you never got married, then well, you, you've never experienced a, 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 the fullness of life. That kind of thinking is con a contradiction to biblical thought. Paul is actually saying here that if someone remains single, they are not to be stereotyped with the group that is, quote-unquote, missed out on the best things in life. On the contrary, Paul says that the single Christian has advantages and benefits that the married group will never consistently have. As a matter of fact, the married couples, if you want to read it this way, are the ones who are missing out on the advantages, the benefits. That would be implied. Believe it or not, and you should believe it because it's written here in the Bible, and it's clearly declared, but there are enormous advantages to being single. What are they? Well, Paul's going to get there. But first he says one other thing. He says, I'm advising you to remain single because it has benefits, and then he says this, and it's not to put a restraint on you. The word restraint in the middle of verse 35, it literally means an animal halter. It's referring to a kind of a, a noose, a lasso around the neck of an animal. So Paul is in no way giving this counsel to capture or constrain these single Christians. He's not trying to tie a rope around their necks and, and lead them to do something that they're not willing to do by bringing them under the bondage of some kind of monastic lifestyle, a life of celibacy. He's not forcing them to do this. Nor is this counsel given to put a damper on the single man or woman who has a strong desire for marriage. Hey, if, that, if that's your desire and you desire to be married, Paul says if, if you burn with passions, then marry. He's not strong-arming any Christian to remain single. But he is advising that this is a beneficial path in life. Why? Look at the end of verse 35. This is the ultimate reason for Paul. The end of verse 35. He, he gives this counsel. Look what he says. To, this is what he wants to do. To promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. 
Paul finally reaches his high point, the high point of all his counsel. He wants to see Christians, single Christian men and women, have an appropriate and orderly and undivided devotion to Jesus Christ. Single saints don't have a marital distraction, hindering maximum Christian service to God and His gospel. Do we understand that? I mean, if you're single here, or even when you were single, did you have that category? Thinking that, wow, I don't have these restraints, these constraints that are holding me back. Do you believe that? That as a single, your purpose is to maximize your efforts because there are no marital distractions. Is that a worthy enough reason for someone to remain single? Paul believes it is. The Bible says it is. Let me just share a few testimonies of some saints that went through either a season of their life uh, being single or remained their entire life uh, being single and were spent in and spending their lives in greater measure for Christ. Trevor Douglas, missionary to the Philippines, has said this, The first advantage of being single is that it's best adapted to uh, perilous situations. In rugged life among primitive tribes, in gorilla-infested areas, or in disease and famine, the single man has only himself to worry about. Doing God's work is a momentary thing. Advantages and opportunities come and go very quickly. The single lifestyle enables one to get the most out of the time God gives for his work. One of my chief delights is that I don't have to fit my ministry around a family schedule. I don't have to be home at a certain time each night. My time is the Filipino's time. David Brainerd, another single missionary who... Uh, ministered to the American Indians in, in mid-18th century, said this. He said, I cared not where or how I lived. And obviously, if you have a family or a wife, then this affects you massively. But a man who could say this personally, he has no other cares. I cared not where or how I lived or what hardships I went through so that I could but gain souls for Christ. While I was asleep, I dreamed of these things. And when I awoke, the first thing I thought of was this great work. Not a wife, not a kid, not to attend to them, not to care for them, just this great work. All my desire was for the conversion of the heathen, and all my hope was in God. No wife, no kids, no family, and yet no regrets. No regrets at all. He didn't miss out on life. Just two examples of how an unmarried Christian is permitted more freedom to serve God and His gospel in this short life apart from any marital companion. Now, if, if you're a single Christian here today, it's very possible that you might be asking yourself, well, how does that relate to me? A David Brainerd, a Trevor Douglas, how, how do they relate to me? What does Christian service and devotion to the Lord look like for a person like me who's not going into full-time ministry or who's not being sent out as a missionary? Well, for the day-to-day -day churchman or churchwoman or layman, whatever you might say, the one who attends a local church and wants to be immersed in the affairs of of the church and wants to be immersed in what God is doing and what Christ is doing and maximizing their spiritual gifts and using them in every aspect of church life, there are massive opportunities there. Any time an opportunity is provided for you, take advantage of it. What does it look like for the single Christian? If the church provides you an opportunity to serve and to use your gifts, take advantage of it. When the church has a need, you meet it. When the church has an emergency brought to their attention of the congregation and your calendar is maybe more freed up than a man or a woman who has a spouse and kids, take advantage of it. Answer the emergency call. Anytime there's an opportunity to serve, serve. Don't, don't just waste your singleness on leisure activity recreation, the freedom to do whatever you want. You're, you're still a blood-bought Christian of Jesus Christ, and your time and your energy and your efforts should be used to that end 
glorifying Christ. Make the most of your current status. Don't sit around contemplating how discontent you are without a spouse when you could be maximizing your undivided devotion to the Lord. Shouldn't be sitting around waiting for God to send you a life companion, maybe even moaning and, and groaning about being unmarried. Your heart should be set on, on maximizing your energy and effort for Jesus Christ while you have that single status. You don't have to be concerned or consumed about any other cares necessarily, at least not marital cares. I think one of the saddest things that I probably see in the Christian community in my time back at Grace Emanuel Bible Church, working among the college and career ministry, is when a, a young man and a young woman, they, they would come together and move in this direction toward marriage, but as they grew in their interest toward one another, their interest in the church and their Christian activities just seemed to fall off. They just seemed to, to diminish. Now, I know this is not the case for every single Christian couple, but many couples who are engaged or just googly-eyed over one another will start their marriage off by withdrawing from more and more Christian activity. Why does the engagement of a couple have to mean the disengagement from the church? I, I never understood that. That seems to be a, a big pattern with many couples. Why do all other Christian relationships suffer when a couple is uh, married off? Why the withdrawal from the service to the Lord? Is it because there is this all-consuming interest with one another that interferes with Christian affairs and activities? I mean, it's one thing to be divided with the things of the Lord and the things of the spouse, you know, balancing those things equally, but it's completely a different thing and a very lopsided thing when a Christian couple is not even balanced in their devotion to the Lord. That's the area that suffers, it seems like. All too often, all their energies are given to this earthly other while their heavenly father has been given the cold shoulder, just shoved to the sidelines. God does not deserve the leave and cleave treatment. God never deserves that type of treatment. We leave our earthly parents and we cleave to our marital companion. We don't leave our heavenly father ever and cleave to an earthly other. I've seen it time and time again. Single person goes on serving well in the church, spends her time giving for the sake of others. And then all of a sudden, Mr. or Mrs. Righteous comes walking in right around the corner and then everything drops off. The Christian pattern changes radically. Sacrificial service drops off. Study and prayer drops off. The giving of themselves to an eternal purpose drops off. Christian fellowship drops off. All attention is now aimed at this temporary relationship. And again, I understand that marriage will bring about some changes and some distractions. Paul is very clear about that point here. But it should not radically alter the mindset and the desire of a Christian from serving Christ and his church. That's not what marriage was designed for. Marriage is to be used as a oneness for the glory of God, not a withdrawal from the glory of God. You know what I think every Christian should do pre-marriage? Every blood-bought Christian has, who's ever made it their passion to, to follow Christ should sit down with their potential spouse and just ask the hard questions, the difficult questions. How do we want our marriage to serve the Lord? Do you want to serve Christ together and not withdraw from any service to the body of Christ? Is our marriage going to be aimed at glorifying God in everything we do? Will we strive for a biblical balance of using our time and efforts and energies to advance the gospel while at the same time not neglecting our marital responsibilities? I mean, if both people are on the same page, time has been spent, it's, you're discerning, move forward with the expectation that not much will change in service to Jesus Christ. But if there are differences there, I would just tell the single person, that person is not a fit for you. If they're not on the same page as you spiritually and devoted to the same things that you are, that person is not a fit for you. Paul does not say that marriage will cause a Christian to cease from all other Christian duties and activities. He says that there will be a divided interest. 
Which means that those who are married will still strive earnestly and diligently to serve the Lord even though worldly interests interfere at times. Just at times. And this may come as a surprise to you, but this text, it actually is an exhortation to those who, of us who are married as well. Married couples and not just singles. As a secondary implication, Paul could easily say to those who are married, I've just informed you how marriage brings a divided devotion in this life. You're devoted to the Lord, but a wife or a husband is also thrown into the mix. And with this spouse comes natural distractions that limit your full and undivided devotion to the things of the Lord. Paul understands that. But now he's saying, you're aware of this. Be all the more diligent earnest to use your marriages for the things of the Lord. Stay married, remain in the situation that you were when you got saved, but sanctify your marriages for Christ. Set apart your marriages for God and don't be consumed with these, this horizontal relationship that hinders your vertical devotion to Christ. Of course, there will be situations that will naturally interfere with unremitting and incessant labor for Christ when a wife, husband, children are part of the daily responsibilities of life. But get your entire family on the same page. Move in the same direction. Be aware of the, the distractions that are in your marriage and try and minimize them so that you can maximize your devotion to Christ. It's a great charge for all of us. It's a great option for those of you who are single to consider. Time is short, maybe not facing the same present struggles, hardships, trials that they were facing in Corinth, but times are getting more and more difficult. If you can, remain single. Be devoted fully, fully committed to the things of the Lord. There are great advantages. No disadvantages. He didn't, he didn't mention any disadvantages. There are great advantages, eternal advantages to maximizing your current single status. And it's all about God and His gospel and making His Son known. <sighs> Heavenly Father, we thank You for just this brief time in this, in this passage. But what an exhortation to the single crowd in the church at Corinth. And what an exhortation for us. Even for us who are married. Realizing that there are distractions out there. And that we need to minimize them as much as possible because... The gospel is worth it, and our time here is short. I pray that we would take these things to heart and that we would all be, we would all have undivided devotion to you. More and more, sanctify us to that end. We love you and we thank you for Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.